Mountain Church. Man, it is so good. I don't care where you're at right now. Just take a moment. We've been worshiping God for the past half an hour, but would you just take a moment right now and just give God praise with a holy clap, amen? Let's just praise the Lord right now and lift up the name that's above every name because he's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of your attention. He's worthy of your time. He's worthy of your honor. He's worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. And we're in this place right now to lift up his name and to continue to give honor honor to him as we celebrate the victory that is ours that is so clearly laid out in his scriptures. I want to welcome all of you that are joining us from our Cornerstone family and for those of you who are joining us from states far beyond uh, Connecticut and even to other shores and other countries, those of you who are tuning in right now, we welcome you and we say thank you because we recognize that this is a divine opportunity that you and I have to be able to connect together for kingdom purposes. So, it is our joy to be with you today. Uh, what an awesome experience it was to, uh, to see our children's ministry at the beginning of our service. That was so much fun, and uh, your interaction was an absolute blast. We got tons of pictures of families taking pictures of their kids participating in those events and, uh, and in that uh, lesson and, and uh, a lot of the chat that went on afterwards. And so we're so thrilled that we had an opportunity to invest into your kids, and so we're constantly trying to refine that and make that experience better for them every single week. And also, as you just saw, Next Steps begins this coming Sunday, one week from today, all three levels, at from 9 to 9.30, all three levels will be uh, being launched at, on Next Steps, and so you can find right in the chat, you can see an online sign-up. And uh, our tech team will be throwing that into the chat, and you can register right there and just tell us what you would like to, uh, that you, that you want to show up for uh, that from 9 to 9.30. So next week, 9 to 9.30, we'll have next steps from 10 to 10.15. We'll have the children's ministry, and then, of course, 10.30, we'll have the morning worship service. It's a full day in the house of God, amen? And uh, so we're excited. Listen, if you remember that we started a series last week called three, and we talked about the importance of the number three or trilogy or trinity uh, or, or thrice in the Bible, and I went through several examples at the beginning of that service, and we talked about things like the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, we talked about the gifts that were given to Jesus at his birth, that he received gold, frankincense, and myrrh, three gifts. We talked about the fact that uh, Jesus was tempted by the enemy three times, the, uh, the, 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 the pride of life, the, uh, uh, the, the, I've, I've forgotten them now, it's slipping my mind, uh, but, uh, but, but three times the devil Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There it is. And, uh, and, and you think this is easy? Man, this is, listen, this is me raw, man. We're out here live. There's no post-production, baby. And, uh, and, so, uh, and, and, and so we talked about the three, uh, the three temptations of Jesus. We talked about the fact that we can't escape the fact that Jesus was in the grave for three days. And during those three days, he defeated three enemies, death, hell, and the grave. And so three is very significant. In fact, we see... See it listed. Uh, we see examples of, of of triplicate 457 times in Scripture. And last week we established this statement. You see, we said that if God says something in the Bible twice, you better pay attention. But if He says it three times, you need to change your perspective. We see that in the life of Samuel. Remember young Samuel when he was under the tutelage of Eli, that Samuel kept hearing a voice waking him up in the night. And in, and in 1 Samuel chapter 3, we hear that uh, Eli tells Samuel, if you hear the voice a third time, you just respond, hear my Lord. You see, because Samuel had to shift his perspective off of Eli and shift it on uh, to the Lord because God was calling him to be the next great prophet 
of Israel. We see, of course, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He made three visits to the Garden. And on the third visit to the Garden, Jesus is praying to his Father and he changes his perspective. He says, Lord, if there's any way to take this cup from my lips, yet not my will but your will be done. His perspective was very focused on the Father. And so we talked about how Jesus, whenever he, uh, whenever he was crucified, that Peter, one of his most devout and, and, uh, and most uh, uh, beloved um, disciples, uh, said, I will die for you, Jesus. But then he denied him three times. And we talked about how Peter wronged Jesus three times. And today we're going to talk about how Jesus restores Peter. Guess what? That's right, three times. And, and so three times, Peter is restored. I want to open up with a quick word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to just invade our lives right now as we get into his word. Father, I thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the honor of being in this place right now. Lord, when so many are struggling and stressed and anxious and hurting and maybe even angry, God, we have an opportunity to wrap our arms around the person of peace, the person of hope, the person of love, the person of strength, the person of shelter, the person of provision, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that as we get into your word, Father, that you would be honored by this time. I pray that you move on hearts, God, that have been so beaten up by their past that when they recognize the restoration power of the Lord, God, that they would turn their hearts heavenward today and give you their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Three times, three times restored is the title of this message. If you remember, uh, Peter denied Jesus three times by a charcoal fire. He was in the, the colonnade or in the courtyard of the Pharisees. Uh, Jesus was gone. He'd been arrested. He was, he was beaten and tried and crucified. And Peter, Peter denies Jesus in that courtyard Three times. And he was standing, the Bible tells us he was standing around a charcoal fire. The scene that we're about to dive into in scripture puts us around another charcoal fire. But this time, the restoration will take place. Because Jesus is going to restore three things in Peter's life. He's going to restore his broken relationships. He's going to restore Peter's broken ability to serve him successfully. And he's going to restore Peter's name and his calling. It's really a powerful thing because so many people short sell themselves. They think they can never have relationship with God. They think that they cannot have the ability to serve him successfully. And they think that they are defined by their past because of all of our mistakes. Yet Jesus is standing at the shore of our life and he's ready to restore you today. Our text is John chapter 21. I'm going to read it to you uh, this morning. and We're going to read three verses. Verse 1 of chapter 21 says this. Afterward, Jesus again appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, and it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan in Galilee, the two sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going to go out to fish. Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out, they got in the boat, they fished all night, and they caught nothing. They caught nothing. See, Peter figured that Jesus must not want him anymore. Peter was broken. Peter was probably depressed. Peter was uh, he, he, was, he was flawed. He, he was uh, remembering all of his betrayal. And so Peter didn't know what to do. And so Peter did what people do when people don't know what to do. He went and he did the things that he used to do. You see, when people, when people don't know what to do, they go back and they do the things that they used to do. 
And this happens all the time to Christians when we make mistakes and we blow it and we fail. We, we, we find that we, we, we tried Jesus out. We, we gave this whole church thing a, a try, but man, it didn't work out for me the way that I thought it was going to work out. And, and so I'm just going to go back to the way things used to be. I tried God, but I failed God, and so therefore God must not want me anymore. So I'll just go back to the way things used to be. I love God, but I'm not worthy of God. I've done too much bad in my life. I've failed him too many times. I'll go back to the way things used to be. I gave it a shot, but I blew it. So I'm going to go back and do what I used to do. And so we end up going back to our old ways. We end up leaning back onto our old losses. We begin trying to find value in our old name. We begin trying to to, uh, orchestrate our life based off our old values. We go back to what is familiar. We go back to old habits. We go back to old circles of friends. We go back to old lifestyles. We go back to doing the things that we used to do when we did things on our terms. And church, if you have found yourself in a place today where you are considering going back to the old way of doing things, you need to understand that that is a frail, fragile, and flabby faith. That, that, that says, that's telling God that, that His grace is not sufficient for you. That's telling Him that, that, that you've gone too far for Him to reach out to you. I promise you, if you stay in that place, if you go back, if you stay in that old life, I am telling you today that your life will never, ever, ever get better. You will, it doesn't matter how much money you acclaim. It doesn't matter how high up the corporate ladder you climb. It doesn't matter how big and how far your network reaches. It doesn't matter how many words and letters you have after your name or, or how many titles you hold. If you go back to the old way of thinking and the old lifestyle, you will always have an emptiness gnawing at your soul because it is, it is a faith that is frail and it can only be filled by the Father. You know, we, we tend to go back to fish for fish. Jesus told Peter, when, when Peter joined the disciples, when Peter became uh, one, of his, one of his followers, he told Peter, he said, Peter, no longer will you fish for fish. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And see, Peter was... The moment that Peter said yes to Jesus, Peter was a man transformed. He was a man changed. And when that change took place, church, what happened was no longer was Peter built for fishing for fish. Peter was now designed to fish for men. This is why Scripture, when you read through Scripture, it talks about uh, uh, total, it uses words of totality, like words like never and words like all. Because, because we, we learn that when you meet Jesus, that you will never be the same again. When you meet Jesus, you'll learn that things are never going to be like they used to be. Even if you return to the old life. When you meet Jesus, you're, you're, never, you're never going uh, to, to be the same. No matter what victories or failures you experience in your life. It's never going to be the same. Because now all things have become new inside of you. So that means and that includes when you blow it big time around the fire in the middle of the colonnade of the Pharisees. You're still new. You're still changed. And things will never, ever be the same. Listen, when you meet Jesus, how you handle your losses will be new. The way that you follow through will be new. The way that you process 
defeat and disruption and disillusionment and disaster. It will all be new. You won't do things the way you used to do. Come on now, I'm preaching myself happy. I don't know how close they got me tied in on this camera, but I'll tell you, my feet got the Holy Ghost dance going this morning. I'm telling you right now, all things become new. The way you process becomes new. Your recovery becomes new. And the way that you fish is new. It's all new, church. And once you become new, God makes all of you new. That's why we serve him with all. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength, with all my spirit, with all my everything, with my all in all. That's why we serve him with all, because all things are new inside and out. Peter Peter was never going to be that same fisherman that he was when he met Jesus on the shores of Galilee three and a half years before. Peter was a new man. Peter Peter was never going to be that arrogant, short-tempered fisherman that he was when Jesus first met him. Peter was new. You see, when Peter first met Jesus, Peter's name was Simon or Simeon. His name literally meant he was heard. But now Peter's Peter's got a new name. Peter meets Jesus and Jesus changes his name from from Simon to Petra or Peter. And his name used to mean, his name used to mean you have heard. But now his name Peter means rock. And so where he meant Peter used to, maybe he heard something about the Messiah. Maybe he heard something about this great teacher named Jesus. But now he would herald the very same power that Jesus had. He was going to be on full display. Jesus put a name upon him. He told him, Simon, now you are Peter. You are Petra. You are the rock. And upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church. Imagine, imagine, this is the man that Jesus would build his church upon. Peter, Peter, and Peter can't seem to do anything right. He always talks out of turn. He's always, his mouth is always ahead of his actions. He, he, he's, he's a disaster on so many levels. Have you ever looked at somebody and thought, how did they become so successful? This is Peter. Peter, he's a train wreck of a disciple on so many levels. Listen, I I consider myself a a fairly tech-savvy individual. I always have been. You know, I was a youth pastor for a decade and a half. By virtue of being a youth pastor, you automatically become the tech guy in churches. (laughs) And, uh, And so... Even though I consider myself pretty technologically astute, the frequency and the magnitude of the streaming that we've been doing over these past five weeks and the different formats and the variations and the different locations and, 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 uh, and all the different software platforms. You realize I'm using seven different platforms We've, we've, I've had to learn Manicam and OBS and Restream and Zoom and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and, and, there's, and there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of cables and there's a lot of lights and there's a lot of angles and there's a lot of this and a lot of that and, and, there's, a, and there's a lot that there's to learn. And can I tell you, this is why sometimes when you log into my daily devotional and the, and the title on it will be from the day before or maybe the graphic of my daily devotional will be from the anchored women from the night before or, or maybe I've got a, a, a title that's not correct or maybe the camera angles are off or maybe the shadows are casting a little bit in the wrong way. And sometimes I just feel like no matter how careful I am and how much I try, I just can't get it right. You ever felt that way? Please hear my heart for what I'm about to say because I mean this in the best way possible. I'm sincere in that. Anytime I make a mistake on a live stream, and that's, that's the risk of the live stream, right? You're without a net. But anytime I get on and I make a mistake, you're very quick to point it out. <laughs> Now, I thank you for that because I don't want to keep making the same mistake if you didn't tell me, like, you don't know what you don't know. And so you learn from your mistakes. 
But, but very quickly, somebody, if they've got my personal cell, they'll text me really quick, and, they'll be, and they're like, hey, man, you know, your, your sound is off, or hey, man, you got to fix this, or, or whatever. Maybe you put it in the chat, and, and, you, say, and, you, and you tell me how, how horrible of a job I've done and what a failure I am of a streamer. No, I know that's not your intent at all. <laughs> and I'm not looking for anybody to feel sorry for me. The truth is, I did fail. The truth is, I did make a mistake. The truth is, I did have an oversight. I did forget a detail. And that happens to me almost every day, but certainly every week. And if I, fo- if I focus on all those failures, guess what? I would never stream again. If I, if I live my life on the platform of how many times I failed every time I went live, then I would just put Pastor JC up here every week. And, uh, but, but if I did that, then nobody would be in the back making all the, you know, connecting all the wires and making everything work. <laughs> but guess what? I do keep showing up. I do keep, I do keep showing up every morning, and I know that every morning it's not going to be perfect. And, 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 and every morning I know that my mistakes, if they're made, they're going to be on full display. And, and I keep showing up and I keep going live. I keep clicking live every day because I know that the more and the more I keep trying, the more and the more I keep going, the less and the less I'm going to blow it. And the more and more I keep clicking live, the more convinced I am that you, the viewer, are far less concerned about my failures and far more concerned about the calling that God's called me to. You see, God has a great thing in store for every one of us, but what he's waiting for us to do is be willing to go live. He's waiting for you to be willing to just step out and trust him despite your failures, despite your shortcomings, despite your missteps. Because you know what? When he makes all things new, he makes all things new. And I'm new. I'm a new work. But I am a new work in progress. I'm a work in progress. I love that old song. My son and I sang it last night together. Actually, he started singing it, and I thought, man, i gotta, I got to put this in the sermon. It's that song, He's Still Working on Me. And there's a line in there that says, it says, It took him just a week to make the moon, the stars, the sun, the earth, Jupiter, and Mars. Seven days, he made all that. He's been working on me for 47 years. Church, I got to tell you something. I'm a work in progress. All the beauty of the earth and creation and and the solar systems and the sun and the planets and and all that that entails, he made that at the the speaking of his word and he made that made that perfect and the the earth is tilted at just the right angle and and we orbit the sun at just the right speed and and our seasons are are calculated and everything works in concert but me his 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 prized creation man guess what he is guess what he's constantly constantly at work inside of us i'm a new work but i'm a work in progress and so are you Just type, that's good preaching in the chat because it is. (laughs) Three times, three times Peter wronged Jesus. But three times Jesus would restore Peter. Why? Why would Jesus bother with Peter? Peter has been, he has been a disruption from the beginning. Peter has put his foot in his mouth more times than, than, than he could count. Peter has just said things so flippantly and without conviction so many times. And when, and when it really mattered, Peter denies Jesus three times. Why would Jesus go through such effort to restore Peter? Because Jesus is still working on Peter. That's why. Jesus wasn't finished with Peter. Jesus is still fine-tuning his creation. Jesus is, can I tell you, he's less concerned about how bad things have been in the past. And Jesus just keeps showing up in Peter's life, waiting for Peter to go live. 
See, because Cornerstone, you, you have to understand, when we stop trying so hard to cover up all of our shortfalls, when we stop worrying about making everything so perfect, and when we just show up and go live and stand in front of Jesus, vulnerable and exposed and leaving nothing to chance, that's when, that's when the restoration takes place. When you have a repentant faith is when restoration takes place in your life. You know, I I don't discredit any church uh, that 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 does that pre-records their services. There are many, many churches out there that are pre-recording their services and then airing them uh, uh, you know, on Sunday mornings. And and I don't discredit that at all. So please don't misunderstand me. Um, that because that is that's a good that's a good and 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 safe practice because it takes a ton of risk out of the equation. Think about it. If you if you pre-record it, it it takes a lot of it makes a lot of practical sense because because now everything is post-produced. Um, you don't you don't have any mistakes. You know exactly what's going to go out onto the stream. Um, you have no risk of losing the internet integrity. You have no risk of uh, lighting going down or the sound system blipping or 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 your your sound guy not showing up or your video guy having a flat tire on the way to church. You have no risk of that. You can control the time. You can plan the strategic moments. You can produce the service. So I. I and there's a lot of value in that. But I got to tell you, there is just something special about just hitting the go live button and stepping out without a net. Because what's happening is that we aren't being produced by man, but the Holy Spirit is producing what he wants to produce in the moment. It's, it's a total faith step. It's, it's a, it's, it's, this service is not orchestrated by anything except the Holy Spirit. So you're not resting in what is safe. You're resting in total faith. Come on. You're not resting in what is safe. You're resting in total faith. See, God's not done with me, and he's not done with you either. He wasn't done with Peter, and he, Peter needed to change his perspective. So he talks to him three times. Do you know that Jesus has a sense of humor? We always kind of picture him as this solemn, respectful, uh, stoic kind of character, and um, yet humble. But he was a bit of a jokester. And, and Jesus kind of jabs at, at Peter and the other disciples that had been out fishing um, because these guys had gone back to what they used to do. They went back to fish for fish. And they caught nothing. And, and so Peter can't even fish correctly anymore. Because now Peter's not even operating in his real calling. And so Peter's demoralized by this. I mean, fishing was natural for him. And now Peter is so beaten up by that that he decides to just bring it in. And Jesus, with his sense of humor, is standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he hollers out to the boat in John chapter 21 and verse 5, and he says this, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered, no. <laughs> it was, there was no excuse there was no, wow, the wind was too choppy, or no, we got, there. you know, it wasn't that... They had no, they just were completely demoralized. And their only answer was, no, I have nothing. Now, Jesus is on the shore. And you know what Jesus is doing? Scripture tells us that Jesus is speaking to them. And while he's speaking to them, he's got a campfire, a little charcoal fire, and he's cooking fish. Jesus already had fish, and he's like, hey, guys, did you catch anything while Jesus is sitting there cooking fish and baking bread? <laughs> and, and, so, and so Jesus is, is making breakfast, and, and 
and so that's, that's kind of the backdrop of what's happening in this, in this scene. And, and so here, and what is, what's really going on here is this, is, is Jesus is saying to the disciples, he's saying, hey, how is your decision to throw in the towel working for you? How is your, how is your choice to go back to your old ways? How's that panning out for you? What'd you catch? Nothing. Because the enemy will promise you great things if you'll just come back to him. But I've never known anybody that had any value in going back with their ex. Amen? Leave your ex alone. The devil used to be your partner, but that's a relationship that was broken when you said yes to Jesus. Don't go back to the way things used to be. That's why the Bible says that it is for freedom that Christ has set you free so that you wouldn't go back to the ways of slavery to sin. And so he says, how's it working out for you? How's that working out for you? How's playing it safe worked out for you, guys? See, he, he, then he does something peculiar. He instructs him, says, hey, why don't, you, why don't you listen to me? Why don't you throw your nets on the other side of the boat? And these guys were done. And they're like, ah, we don't want to do we would. Okay. And so they throw the nets on the other side of the boat. And the Bible says that they caught so many fish that they could barely pull the nets in. And it even tells us they caught 153 large fish. Now, I've been to the Sea of Galilee. I've seen a first century fishing boat. It could have been the very boat that we're referring to because they found it in the, in the sea uh, sunk. But, uh, but regardless, I will tell you that those boats are not really large. And 153 Large fish with all those guys that were already in the boat would have been enough to capsize that boat. And so, and so here's the teaching. Here's what Jesus is trying to say to the disciples. He's saying, guys, without me, your perspective is always going to be through the lens of your losses. But with me, you will accomplish way more than you could ever imagine or think. Matthew chapter 20, uh, 19 and verse 26 says this. Nothing. Look at your neighbor and say nothing. Say it with an Italian accent. Nothing. <laughs> it's a, nothing is impossible for those who are in. Are you in? For those who are in Christ Jesus. So friend, you have a choice. You can stay in or you can choose sin. What do you choose? You see, if you stay in Christ, it includes cutting your losses and going live. Stay in Christ and you will cut your losses and you go live. You say, but I made so many mistakes. I went fishing and I failed. I failed around the fire. I failed as a disciple. I failed at every turn. You cut your losses and you keep pressing live. You keep stepping up to the microphone every single day. You keep on trying no matter what the circumstances are. We were just led in worship by our worship leader, Mike Taylor. Mike, every Wednesday, does Wednesday worship with Mike and the, the Taylor Trio. <laughs> It was, a Taylor, it was a Taylor solo, then it became the Taylor duo, and now it's a Taylor trio. But here's the thing. Mike keeps pressing live. And can I tell you, can I tell you that the first time that he went live, there was like 19 people online. And, and so we made some adjustments, and we did some advertising, and then the numbers skyrocketed, but the sound was terrible. And then we tried it again, and the sound got better, but the, but the, uh, the signal kept glitching, and, and he kept freezing. And, 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 and then we tried it again, and we forgot to advertise. And, and, so, and so over and over and over, if Mike will allow, then, then all he could focus on is, is how many times he failed. But see, Mike doesn't show up and go live because he's trying to impress anybody on the other side of the camera. What he's trying to do is twofold. He wants to bring a blessing to you in your living room, but more importantly, he wants to bring a blessing to his Father in heaven. And for that reason, he keeps going live. See, they, they catch all these fish, 153 large fish. And so what does Jesus do next? Does he scold Peter and say, Peter, you are such a failure. You are a loser. You are the worst of all my disciples. You said things out of, a, out of empty... 
No, he doesn't do any of that. Jesus does something so tender and so loving. Can I tell you something? When you, and your, when you are in your darkest moment, Jesus will do for you what he did for Peter. He'll invite you to breakfast. He made him breakfast. Listen, you don't make breakfast with people you don't want to be around. You don't want to start your day off that way. Jesus wanted to be with Peter. And so he made him breakfast. Jesus could have said anything, and he would have been right. He, instead, he makes them breakfast, and then he pulls this broken shell of a man named Peter aside, and he restores him. Not once, not twice, three times. Three times. I want to read it to you. It's found in John chapter 21, verse 15. It says this. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time, the third time, the third time, church, Jesus uh, says to Simon, of, uh, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Now, there's an interesting play on words in the Greek language here in this context. Yeah, I want you to understand that in the Greek language, there are many words that we translate our word love to. For the most part, there's three major ones that we see in Scripture. There's the word eros, the word phileo, and the word agape. Those are three different words in the Greek language, and yet um, all three of them we translate as love in the English language. So there's a, there's a play on words here that you need to understand in, to understand how important this conversation is. You see, Jesus and Peter are using uh, this, this, the, uh, they're, they're exchanging the word love back and forth, forth. And the first time Jesus asks Peter, he says, do you love me in verse 15? And what he does is he uses the word agape. And that word agape is a self-sacrificial, self-giving love. And essentially what Jesus is saying to Peter is, Peter, do you love me enough to give your life for me? That's what he's saying to him. And Peter, with the denial of Jesus still fresh in his heart and on his mind, can only answer, Lord, you know that I phileo. Phileo is a different word for love. It's a word which implies affection and brotherly kind of love. It's, a, I got your back, but I'm not going to die for you. I've got a limit to my commitment. And so it's a strong friendship, but it's not unconditional. It's not self-giving. It's not sacrificial. And it's as if Peter is saying, Lord, you know that I really do care a lot about you. And I don't know that if I can honestly say that I would give my life for you because I already proved that I couldn't three times. But you do know my heart, Jesus, and, and I do have strong feelings of affection toward you, and I'm broken for the way that I have let you down. You see, the upside to this whole conversation is that for the first time in Peter's entire career as a disciple, he's no longer boasting about how great of a disciple he is. He has replaced that with an honest admission of his limited love for the Lord. And, and so even at that, Jesus comes back a second time and he says, well, he, he tells him, he says, then go ahead. He said, feed my lambs. And then he comes back a second time and he says, Peter, do you love me? In verse 16. And again, he uses the word agape. And Peter again answers, Lord, you know that I phileo. I failed you, Lord. And, and, and to be honest, I cannot say that I could give my life for you. But you know my heart, and you know that I have strong feelings for you. And Jesus says, that's okay. Take care of my sheep. And then the third time, 
the third time, Jesus asks Peter, do you love me in verse 17? And this time, Jesus uses the same word that Peter's been using, the word phileo. He says, Peter, do you phileo? And it's as if Jesus is asking Peter, do you even have strong enough feelings of affection toward me? And it's as if, and this must have grieved Peter, not that Jesus asked him three times, but that on the third time, Jesus seemed to question Peter's limited love for the Lord. Peter responds and says, Lord, you know everything. On the surface, it doesn't look like I've been a good friend to you at all. But I will tell you this, you know that I love you. And Jesus, in his tender, gracious mercy, says, and go feed my sheep. And, and, and it says, it's just, Jesus is saying, what he, this is what he's saying to Peter. He's saying, listen, I know that you love me, even though you failed me. I know that you love me, even though you failed me. And I'm willing to forgive the failure. But even though your actions haven't shown that you love me, I know your heart. And Peter, I still want you to fulfill your calling. I still want you to go fish for men. Stop fishing for fish. That's your old way. You're all things new, Peter. Turn your perspective back on me, Peter, because I still have chosen you as Petra, and you are the rock. You are not the man who sees and who has heard. You are Peter, and on you, Peter, I will build my church. And he restores Peter's name, and he restores his calling. He's saying, I still want you to fulfill that great calling that I called you to. I called you off the shores the shores and the seas of Galilee, and I put you into service for my kingdom's sake. And my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Peter, I chose you. And so Peter confesses his failures, and it enables him to be restored. And because he was restored... He was able to go live. He was able to go live. Church, we're going to talk about that next week. You do not want to miss next week. Because when you have a man on fire (laughs) who's been released by the Father, there is nothing, there is nothing that will stop the calling of God in your life. No pandemic, no virus, no quarantine, no nothing. Nothing can stop the message of God. Can I tell you, the devil's been trying to stop this message since the message began to be heard. He's been doing everything he can. He's tried to burn Bibles. He's tried to completely annihilate the whole country, uh, the whole country of Israel. Uh, the, the attack has, has been frequent and, and, and ongoing since the beginning of time. You cannot stop the truth of God. And you cannot stop the calling that God called you to. Despite your failures, you need to understand that if you have a heart that's willing to receive, then God will restore you. He'll restore your name. And He'll restore your calling. All you have to do is confess your failures like Peter did. Admit your sin. Concede your defeat. Jesus will not condemn you. You... Listen, so many people think that Jesus is, is some, is some uh, God with this, this iron fist just waiting to strike you down. But Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 17, it says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He didn't come, he didn't come to, to condemn the world. He came to confirm you as his child call you back to service you have to understand the heart of God he truly does have a plan for every single one of you irregardless of your age irregardless of your background irregardless of your of your shortcomings irregardless of anything that you have uh, any excuse that you can make God still has a purpose and a plan for you maybe you're resolved that you're too far gone that you made too many mistakes, that you missed too many opportunities.
through any betrayals, even at that, after you've been there trying to think, and we do this, we try to fix our life on our own, you're going to find that for all the efforts that you apply yourself to, to to try to fill that void, you're going to come up short. Jesus is the only thing that will fill your life this morning. Could it be that Jesus is standing at the shore of your life today and he's made you breakfast and he's inviting you to come sit by that fire and he wants to fulfill your calling and to fulfill your name to reestablish your purpose. Do you love him? I want to say a prayer for you today and if you have not made that commitment to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer in the privacy of your home. And if you pray this prayer and you say yes to Jesus, we encourage you to let us know and we'll give you some instruction on that. But would you just bow your heads with me all across the internet today and let's ask Jesus to forgive us of our sin. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you stand at the shores of our life and you're ready to call us to breakfast. And I pray today, Jesus, that you would forgive me of all of my sin. I have made a lot of mistakes. And I've got a lot of betrayal in my past. But I know that you love me with an unconditional agape love. And that no matter what level my love is for you, that your love has been self-sacrificial. That you gave everything so that I could have everything. And so Jesus, it's with a humbled heart that I accept your gift of salvation today. I love you, Jesus. And I commit my life to you and to service for you. I pray that you would come in and make all things new. And that I will never fish for fish again the way I used to but Lord that I would go and fish for men as you're calling me to in Jesus mighty name amen amen God bless you thank you so much for tuning in today